Welcome along, fellow time travelers. This is Scott Cardinal, and I'm joined by my friend, Manny Grossman. Uh, this time around, we're going to talk more about the Son of Sam, and um, it's going to be cool. So sit back and pour yourself a cup of coffee, or a tankard of tea, or a mug of mead if you happen to have one, or a flagon filled with any beverage of your choice, and join us around the campfire. Hey, Manny, what's happening, brother? Oh, not much, Scott. Hey, it, I gotta say thanks, man. I mean, uh, all of a sudden I'm in the stratosphere with all these new subscribers who come over from your channel, and I gotta say, very positive and nice people. Um, so I'm very, very impressed, and I'm very thankful, and uh, we're rocking and rolling today. Well, I'm not sure if you know the proper terminology, Manny, but they are our nomies. Oh, okay, all right. What's yeah. going on, nomies? How you doing over here? <laughs> like, some people used to say, "Hanging with my homies." We're hanging with our nomies. Is that from Garden Gnome? Uh, maybe, but they were time traveling nomies, which is even better. <laughs> we could zoom all over the place. Just pick a time. We can go to disc in, to in the seventies. The disc, in fact, that's what we're going to do. We're going to awesome. time travel to the seventies, aren't we? We are. We're going back to seventy-seven. We're going. Well, actually, today we're going to be going back to the from to, to basically until from the seventies until uh, eh, and then the early two thousands. But uh, we're starting, of course, back in the the e eventful and dark decade of the seventies. Wow. All right. So no more disco at that point. No, Disco Dave had seen better days, and by the time he, this this conspiracy theory came into uh, into focus, uh, new wave was the uh, order of the day, my friend, mm, and, and okay. punk as well. Wow. All right. Nothing wrong with that, I suppose. But uh, Disco had to die at some point, I guess. <laughs> All right, man. We're gonna do. We're gonna hit your photos here. Is that what we're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You know, I have a T-shirt. I'm gonna wear it one of these days. It says "Disco Rules." You suck. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would do. The poor BJs, right? They really got sucked into that. You know, they they didn't create disco, but they got so they got so closely associated with it. I know that their music was called disco, and they're like, no, no, it's just BJ's music. And if you, I mean, that stuff is genius, really. That Saturday, especially the Saturday Night Live uh, Fever stuff. I mean, just I'm, I'm learning it on my bass right now. I'm learning. Um, I forget the name. Uh, well, you can tell by the way I move my bed that whatever that song is, <laughs> the bass line is so amazing. It's just, uh, I mean, it, these guys were great. Staying but we alive. got, yeah, staying alive. Duh. But we got, we got darker things to talk about to you, for, with you guys today. We got satanic stuff to, for you to talk about. Yes, we satanic do. Cult stuff. Yes, we do. All right. Before we get into everybody, please like, uh, hit the like button. That would be much appreciated. Like, 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 like. Uh, share this if you know people out there that might be interested. Please let them know about it. Um, I know it's a weird day, Sunday, and all that other stuff, but here we are, uh, and share along. So, all right, Manny, get rolling. Yeah, no problem. So, of course, last week, Scott, we dealt with uh, the very important topic of well, the Son of Sam crimes themselves, and we basically went through the crimes one by one. Um, what Disco Dave Berkowitz had to say about each crime. And, uh, you know, it was a fairly straight ahead show. Um, guy goes out, stalks people in lovers' lanes, kills uh, several people. Um, they end up finding him, arresting him a year later. He says the dogs told him to do it. He confesses to all the crimes, pleads guilty, ends up in Attica, six consecutive life terms case closed right that's what everybody thinks everybody moves on new york breathed the sigh of relief the son of sam crimes they were over but not so fast i thought that was the end of the story there's more no unfortunately well or fortunately depending on your on your mindset there is a hell of a lot more scott and that's what we're going right. to deal with today so it. whereas most people in 1977 when berkowitz was arrested breathed the sigh of relief and moved on with their lives um, one dogged individual up in Yonkers, New York, by the name of Maury Terry, well, he started doing some research. And of course, at the end of all this research, he ended up with a, well, essentially a conspiracy theory, a, 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 a way to explain the Son of Sam crimes that essentially took Berkowitz out of the equation almost completely and put in his place a nationwide satanic cult of which he was just a member and which he only did a few of the shootings so before we get into those theories and we'll and we'll of course tell you about uh the genesis of this of this theory what it entailed all its salient points etc cetera, etc cetera. first let's just show you of course the man himself now this was maury terry in his heyday 
This was directly in the middle of his doing all the uh, promo for his book, The Ultimate Evil, which we'll show you in a second. But these are actually promo shots, which I own. Um, I have a lot of Sa Son of Sam memorabilia, Scott, from doing this uh, doing this video series, some of, some of which is pretty amazing, actually. I don't even want to say on the air some of the things I have. But um, one of the... Stuff, or you mean like uh, keychains gift shops? No, oh, original, original, okay. original. All right. Because I've been looking for a good son of the Sam, son of Sam uh, keychain. Not easy to find. <laughs> I have some things that would blow blow the uh, son of Sam uh, community away. I, ha I, I, and and they're not here in my apartment. I actually keep them in a safe house because they're so valuable. Wow! But, um, well, like I say to the ladies, blow away. I mean, <laughs> keep continue on. I meant continue on. But this is Maury Terry in his element. Now, of course, where is he? Well, this is a spot that's familiar to all of my fans. Um, this is the Aqueduct Trail in Yonkers. Now, the Aqueduct Trail plays a prominent role in Maury Terry's cult thesis. It's the roadway that leads from Berkowitz's apartment here in the back. And that's not the only important uh, real piece of real estate in this neighborhood. But it's the it's if you walk up this trail up about a mile, you end up in the infamous Untermeyer Park, scene of satanic rituals and sacrifice, of which Berkowitz was involved with the rest of the Son of Sam cult. But that's a story which we have yet to get to. So this is Maury Terry. He's walking around Yonkers. And of course, these are interesting photographs because these are his promo shots, staff photo caption, right? April 10th, 1984, uncovering the Son of Sam cult investigative reporter Maury Terry on the trail of Son of Sam cult behind him in the upper right is apartment build is is apartment building where David Berkowitz aka Son of Sam lived left is the aqueduct trail leading to Untermeyer Park where signs of the satanic cult is found I don't know who wrote this whoever wrote this needs a copy editor and of course here's Maury Terry in one of these underground structures in Untermeyer Park. Now, we have done extensive work on Untermeyer Park, Scott, um, in my video series. And if people want to see this park uh, firsthand, you're not going to get better footage than my video series. We've been in every nook and cranny in that park, every little hidden secret spot. We have found things in that park that, um, well, have been rumored about for decades, and we actually found them. But uh, that's a whole story for another day. This, of course, is the famous, or I should say infamous, Devil's Cave at, at Untermeyer Park in Yonkers, New York. The scene of satanic sacrifices and rituals in which David Berkowitz and his compatriots in the Son of Sam cult took part, sacrificing children, raping killing dogs and so on and so forth. They weren't raping dogs, raping, raping ch kids and killing dogs and, and all sorts of assorted mayhem. And of course we see here the uh, very occultic satanic graffiti that was found in this, in this spot, which was demolished in 1984 when they were building an annex onto a, onto a hospital that was, that's just North of Untermeyer park. So this unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. Believe me, I would have loved to have seen this as a Son of Sam researcher. But we see the same symbols that are in the Son of Sam letters, right? Connecting this this right here to the Son of Sam letters, right? Direct connection, same symbols, upside down crosses, pentagrams. And so more did, that, did this yeah. all happen because of the Son of Sam? Or were these people that were already involved in other things and then they focused their energy in this direction when that began to manifest? Correct. Well, according to Maury Terry in his book, this actually goes back to the 1950s, Scott, with um, with Nazi sympathizing doctors moving to uh, moving to Yonkers from England and starting a ritual magic club that that involves sex with children. And over the ensuing decades, it morphed into a very violent, satanic rather than druidic uh, uh, order. And by 1977, a, a new group called The Process uh, Church of the Final Judgment had had made inroads into Untermeyer Park and was pulling were pulling the strings of the Son of Sam cult, but we haven't gotten there yet. But okay. um, yes, we this was uh, something that was multi generational, multi decade, and in fact, as our research have shown has shown, this activity in Untermeyer Park actually extended all the way up to about 1990, which is highly interesting. So then here's Maury Terry, of course, his promo shots, and here's another one of these conclusive links to the son of sam letter we have the the x's with the arrows on them which of course can be found in part in the son of sam symbol so okay so maury terry starts doing research he starts inquiring around town and well 
It leads to a series of newspaper articles in 1979 in the Herald Statesman, which was a sub, uh, a sub, I guess, a, I don't know what the word is, but it was a chapter of the Gannett newspapers, which I believe were nationwide newspapers, but I could be wrong about that. But the Herald Statesman was the Yonkers newspaper that everybody read. And as you know, Scott, you grew up in New York City. You, you know how important newspapers were back in the day. I mean, that, there was no Internet. That, that was how that was how everybody got their information. What's this newspaper thing you speak of? It's on paper. <laughs> I remember every day I would read the newspaper at breakfast. And, you know, even when I was a teenager, I was kind of a nerd like that. But this was the famous article, of course, satanic cult at Untermeyer linked to Son of Sam, conclusively proving that the Son of Sam crimes were linked to a satanic coven in Untermeyer Park and that Berkowitz was only a member and not uh, and not the lone killer in the Son of Sam spree. So this was a highly influential article, and it shows the same Devil's Cave as we saw a picture before. And this article, as I said, influenced a lot of people, including law enforcement, who um, many of which became big proponents, especially in Yonkers, of certain few key Yonkers police department people became allies with Maury Terry. Um, and they later in the 90s were helped him research uh, research the case. So, of course, this wasn't the only article that Maury Terry wrote. In 1979 to 1981, Maury Terry probably wrote about 40 articles, maybe more, maybe less, give or take, all about the conspiracy in Son of Sam. How Berkowitz could have been arrested earlier if Yonkers PD had done better, had done better work. How Berkowitz said that there were other members of the cult. Did Berkowitz really kill Stacey Moskowitz? And this was a huge thing. Uh, a huge subject. Um, this was the eighth and final shooting, and it was extremely controversial. Uh, this was the one where Berkowitz got his um, parking ticket. And, and Maury Terry went to the Brooklyn scene, and he reenacted it and he, uh, where Berkowitz was parked and where witnesses placed him and so on and so forth. And he um, conclusively showed to the public proved to the public that Berkowitz could not have actually walked the distance he needed to walk to and the time allotted in order to kill Stacey Moskowitz. And then, in fact, Stacey Moskowitz was killed by a uh, an imported shooter from North Dakota. North Dakota? What the hell? Well, huh? North Dakota? Believe me, we're going to get to North Dakota in a little bit, guys. I got you all back. So, of course, all of these newspaper articles and all of his research and all of his work over a decade of time culminated in the 1987 release of The Ultimate Evil, the shocking true story behind 20 years of bizarre ritual murder. And look at whose picture is on here, Scott. That would be uh, Charles Manson. I call him Charlie. Right. Charlie is on here, of course, prominently featured next to a picture of, well, who else? Disco Dave Berkowitz, so-called by our by by us at my at my station because he loved to go to the discos to prowl for victims. Um, so is that your, is that your, is that the main motivation uh, of calling him that? Or do you think it's helpful to sort of rob him of his uh <laughs> Right. I mean, he wanted to be called. He doesn't want to be called Disco Dave, I'm assuming. No, no. This is linguistic memes. This is important. Yes. This is ling this is linguistic kill shots um, yep. of which Trump was highly, highly influential. And, and like nobody mm -hmm. came up with better names than that guy. And I was very influenced by him to uh, come up with names for for all these people. And Dave has become Disco Dave Berkowitz. So that's as what it we should be. Him. Yeah. Right, exactly. Rob him. Rob him of some of the fame and some of what he wanted. Good thinking. Exactly. And so Disco Dave, one would be led to believe by looking at this cover that, well, the Disco Dave and Charlie Manson were, were were buddies, were joined at the hip, were involved together. And of course, that's what the uh, essentially what the book tries to put forth, that the same cult that was responsible for the Son of Sam crimes in 1977 was the actually the same cult that was controlling and uh, and uh, uh, Charlie Manson in 1969, and that there were connections between the two with similar uh, with um, with a certain person that we're going to look at a little later. That is the connect between Manson's original people and the Son of Sam crimes. But we'll we'll get to that in a logical fashion. Cool. 
So the book begins, if anybody reads The Ultimate Evil, and I highly recommend that you do because it's it's a seminal book in true crime history. It influenced hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people to think about the Son of Sam crimes in a certain way, uh, myself included. Okay. Now, the author is no longer alive. Is that correct? Correct. Maury Terry, okay. unfortunately, passed away in 2015, possibly okay. 2016. I'm not quite sure of the date there. I could be wrong about it. It was one of those two years. And I actually tell the story about how in 2009, I was working on a gardening gig, Scott. And um, I struck up a conversation with some friends of mine in the building I was gardening in. And they actually were friends with Maury Terry's sister. So I begged I cajoled, I pleaded to, to meet Maury Terry, and I was told in no uncertain terms, uh, you don't want to meet this guy. Um, believe me, you don't want to meet him. And so, uh, you know, I don't want to I don't want to get too much into the man in this episode because um, I do not want to, uh, you know, I, I want this episode to be a, a fairly basic recounting of the tale. And so we don't want to talk too much about the man. But unfortunately, I never met Maury Terry. I was I was very um, sad about that. I, I was I, I had seen myself as his sidekick. He was going to see me as his heir apparent and that I was going to continue the mantle on. Wow. Well, I'll Didn't... tell you what, if you want to uh, uh, briefly pause for a yeah. uh, positive moment, uh, one of our favorite nomies. And one of our mods, Alegria, today is her birthday. So hey. everybody, all my fellow nomies, let us wish Alegria a happy birthday. Alegria, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy yes. birthday. Happy birthday. So she's awesome. She's been with us for quite a while, and she's the best of the best. We appreciate it. You can and never have too many nomies. No, definitely not. And I'm and I'm starting to see a lot of your nomies' names pop up in my comment section and chat. So big shout out to everybody out there. And let me tell you something. All of my fans, we're accepting the new people with open arms. We love it. Awesome. Yeah, everybody, go ahead and click on the link and uh, check out Manny's channels and subscribe and like this video, like his videos. So for a lot of people I see are joining us right now, do you want to just very quickly give an overview of why this book was written and what was his history? Was this his first book? Did he come out of the blue? Was he? Who was yes. this guy? Maury Terry was a, actually a staff writer for, uh, I guess, in-house publications for IBM, International Business Machines, which had a headquarters up in um, northern Westchester near like Bedford area, White Plains. And so he was working there and he um, did fancy himself a, an investigative journalist. So this was actually a pet project that he took on a, on his own. And um, it just became his obsession in life. And he uh, became known as the son of Sam guy. And and so, you know, and then so but the ultimate evil was his first and only book. There were no other books printed by Maury Terry. And the ultimate evil went into, um, I don't know, three or four printings. And of course, for those of you who want to see a really, really great overview of what I'm saying now of the of the presentation that I'm giving now. You should watch Sons of Sam, the Netflix special, a four part, a four part um, documentary, which goes into greater detail than I'm going to give here. I'm just kind of giving a book report, a Cliff Notes version. But if you want a really detailed analysis into Maury Terry, not only the man, but his theories as well, um, I highly recommend the Netflix documentary. Did he have a lot of competition at the time with other books that had come out before his or at the same time or a little bit after? The only there were all, there were no there was nobody literally nobody in New York or anywhere in the world looking into alternative theories into Son of Sam. Wow. The public was satisfied. The police were satisfied. Uh, the press was satisfied, and um, the only books that had come out were like uh, you know official stories. You know Jimmy Breslin wrote a, wrote one about the about the the crimes. Lawrence Klausner was a pop a, a pop author at the time. He wrote you know, the son of Sam, but it was just basically recounting the official stories. Do you believe, do you believe that he believed everything he wrote or do you think he did it just to kind of bring in some moolah? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. To ask that question. Um, well, the, the, uh, the, the uh, our nomies are asking, I'm asking on their behalf. All right. Well, the, the, the truth is I cannot see how Maury Terry believed everything he wrote. I just absolutely cannot see it because well, I mean, again, I didn't want to get into this in this episode, but just for the nomies, I'll let you know. I have since become Maury Terry's um, biggest critic, and I actually just did a pod, a, a video a, a, an hour ago uh, disproving something from the ultimate evil. I, I, 
really haven't given much thought to this question, but if I had to be forced to give an answer, I would say that Maury Terry knew he was not giving us the full and accurate story because he had access to the same information I do, but the way he interpreted it was off the charts completely wrong. Got but it. um again that's right. for next that's for next week today right. today we'll everybody yeah today everybody you just need to like we just are talking about the cult thesis we're just an analyzing it so the book if you read it it begins in 1974 in california okay it's california huh what i thought son of sam happened in new york well it did but remember maury terry linked this to a nationwide uh, satanic cult um, that was working well as far away as, as California and starting in 1974. And who was this uh, uh, unfortunate victim of the, f the first victim of this cult that ended up becoming the Son of Sam cult? Well, a woman, um, young woman, I should say, by the name of Arliss Perry. Arliss Perry was found in the Stanford uh, University Church in California, Palo Alto, California. Okay, or Stanford, California on Monday, October 14th, 1974. And she was found in the church in a, a stabbed and strangled and placed in a ritualistic position. We're not going to get into the um, graphic details of her, of how the way she was found. If anybody is truly interested in that aspect of the story, the information is out there. But she was found lying face up in the memorial church. And it was deemed at the time to be, well, very oddly uh, ritualistic, potentially satanic murder. Wow. And, uh, and this inc incidentally, we have a code word with the Nomis. If you think that you're going to say something incredibly graphic uh -huh. that's going to make somebody vomit or freak out or get mm -hmm. triggered or whatever the hell, just say cellophane. You say cellophane warning and people know to go run and hide and put a pen okay. over their head or something like that. <laughs> and then you can go and then you can continue on, say whatever you want here. But that is the official right. term that we use as a warning. I just wrote it. I just wrote it down. So I'll, I'll keep that in mind for sure. It's such a so, nice word too, isn't it? Cellophane. It is. And you know, it's a cellophane. nice product too. I, I mean, you don't really, I don't, cellophane was like something from the old, I don't, I haven't held a piece of cellophane in a while. There was a I, contest a long time ago with like weirdos like me, but uh -huh. like love words. And actually there was a vote to see who, what was like the most beautiful word in the English language. And I think it was cellophane that won. Really? Yeah. I didn't vote because this is before my time, but you know, there's a, yeah, cellophane. Because if you think about it, just don't associate it with cellophane. Think about it as just the word itself. The word, just the way the cellophane. word sounds. Cellophane, yeah. Yeah, it does have a nice sound to it. It's very unlike the word moist, which a lot of people hate. I just found that out about a year ago, that that that, that the word moist is very polarizing. And we'll probably have a lot of people in the chat uh, talk people about people it. People associate it with drool, that's why. Yeah. And though yeah, some well, women do like to be drooled upon and licked, not all of them do. <laughs> But all women love cellophane, let's be honest. And they're swooning right now as we speak. That's true. And yeah. wrapping themselves in cellophane is something I would like to see. But listen, that's another, <laughs> another, yeah. Let's, let's, that's let's a Saturday one. night show. That's a Saturday night show. All right. So let's get back to here. All right. So, and so interestingly enough, this was a national story. Um, this is, uh, this is from the Daily News in New York, in New York City, right? Here's an article from Kingston, New York, which is just a small little, basically a small little, well, I don't want to diss the people from Kingston, but it's a small city in upstate New York. Um, but it became a big story nationwide. And you see Arliss Perry here in her picture without the glasses um, in an article in, uh, in, in Kingston, New York. I tried to blow it up here. Kind of hard to see, but um, take my word for it. That says Kingston. So, all right slain in stanford church 19 what does this have to do with with our story in in yonkers new york well the connect here is where arliss perry was from originally if you look at the arliss perry story you realize very quickly that she was a native of bismarck north dakota okay now it says it some here right here the perry couple was from bismarck north dakota and had married last august all right, so remember, she's from North Dakota, all right? And she was a, uh, a a devout Christian from North Dakota. File that in the memory banks. So now we have the North Dakota connection, okay? So this is going to be the first nationwide connect. So we have so we have California, right? And then and then North Dakota comes into play because Arliss Perry, who we're going to connect to Son of Sam a little later, okay? Arliss Perry was from North Dakota, but there's a further 
interesting things that happen in North Dakota, particularly surrounding this gentleman right here, John Carr. Now, John Carr plays a huge role in the conspiracy story because John Carr, according to Maury Terry, was a co-conspirator of David Berkowitz and a shooter in at least one of the Son of Sam crimes. Interestingly enough, John Carr was also a son of Sam Carr. And for those of you who are new to the case, Sam Carr owned Harvey, the talking dog that ordered Berkowitz to kill. He lived across the street from Berkowitz and Yonkers, and here's the Dakota connection. We're going to expand upon this in a little while, but he was in the Air Force in Minot, North Dakota. He was also friends with this guy. Okay, And this is what's important for our story. John Carr and David Berkowitz were joined at the hip, according to Maury Terry. They couldn't have been better friends. They were they they bummed around Yonkers together. They they went to Untermeyer Park together and, and, and conducted satanic rituals. They they ritually slaughtered animals in Untermeyer Park together. They um, uh, John Carr was a rapist, suffocator and strangler of young prepubescent teenagers, according to David Berkowitz. And they were, again, partners in crime in the Son of Sam affair. Now, this is, of course, Disco Dave. Right. And here's David Berkowitz's building. And this whole area surrounding his building, I'm trying to circle it right here with my with my cursor, is where the entire story almost in Yonkers takes place. Why? Because just beyond these trees that you see right here, and this was taken with drone footage that I had um, commissioned uh, two weeks ago. You can see all this footage on my, on my website. Right here, those trees are right here that I just pointed to. Right here is where the cars lived. This is the infamous car house where Harvey the talking dog roamed the backyard, barking and howling and shrieking into the night orders for Berkowitz to kill. Okay, And of course, above the trees is Berkowitz's apartment building, which looks down upon the car household. And Berkowitz's apartment was right here, apartment 7E, top floor, fire escape. And of course, John Carr was also the sister of Wheat Carr. We, we saw Wheat Carr in, our, in last week's show. Wheat Carr was the police dispatcher who was the one that received the call from NYPD inquiring about a parking ticket they had found the night of Stacey Moskowitz's murder and immediately on the phone to NYPD fingered David Berkowitz as the son of Sam. Now, that's suspicious. How did she know that David Berkowitz was the son of Sam? Well, according to to Maury Terry, Wheat Car was another shooter in the Son of Sam in the Son of Sam cult. Right here, you're 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 seeing, according to Maury Terry, the murderess of Virginia Voskarichian, one of the Son of Sam victims, and potentially the getaway driver of the car, the infamous yellow Volkswagen, at the Moskowitz shooting at the uh, end of uh, at the the last shooting in the spree. And of course, Wheat Car is shown here with Harvey, the talking dog. And of course, right here is John Carr and Wheat Carr's father, Sam Carr. Sam Carr, of course, is one of the protagonists of the Son of Sam story. He's one of the of the people. Uh, he his dog Harvey, okay, bayed out ferociously into the night, ordering Berkowitz to kill. So this is Sam and his dog right here. Sam is the father of Wheat Carr and John. We have already showed that Maury Terry had, has linked John Carr and Wheat Carr to the Son of Sam cult with David Berkowitz. Now, what gets interesting is that if you look at all the sketches of Son of Sam, well, they look very different from one another, right? Here you have a guy with frizzy hair. Here you have a guy that looks kind of Hispanic. Here you have a guy looking like he's wearing a cheap wig. Here you have a guy who looks, well, exactly like David Berkowitz. Let's face it. Here you have a teenager wearing a brown, a brown cap. And here, the shooter of the Lomino de Masi, two women on their stoop in Queens. Look at the resemblance between John Carr. It's uncanny. Parted hair. The only thing they disagreed on was what side the part was. But other than that, a spitting image of John Carr. Now, for the benefit of our, of our nomies, uh, as you're speaking right now, are you speaking as Manny Grossman or are you speaking on behalf of this book and the theory? I'm speaking on behalf of the book and the theory. I, I, I actually want to say that 
You don't want the Nomi's freaking out on you. Yeah, I don't want anybody. I mean, I don't want to say this because I don't want to prejudice the audience. I really don't. And, and as a journalist, I, I feel it's almost unethical to do so. However, I'm I'm speaking now as a as I'm acting in a sense. I, I don't believe a word I'm saying. I'm I'm just I'm just telling you the story from Maury Terry's book. I'm just giving you a book report on Maury Terry. OK. So just so you know that I'm not endorsing this theory. In fact, I'm the biggest Maury Terry critic out there. But for the sake of the audience, I think that it's it's wise for them to get an overview of this book. And I'm trying to do it without editorializing. And I'm trying to do it dispassionately, um, just so we all know that. So I'm trying not to add my opinions. I'm just trying to give the story as it as it was given to us. So John Carr, of course, has an, un, has an uncanny resemblance to one of the shooters and of course, this <clears throat> this is what led um, one of the things that led Maury Terry to think that, that not only there were multiple shooters of Son of Sam, because we can see all the different sketches, but that John Carr in particular was one of the shooters. All right. And of course, it wasn't just that little bit of evidence that that convinced Maury Terry that John Carr was involved. Well, John Carr's nickname, he was named in one of the Son of Sam letters. Here are some names to help you along. Forward them to the inspector for use by NCIC. The Duke of Death. The Wicked King Wicker. Now, these were aliases of Son of Sam, apparently. <clears throat> Whoever wrote this Son of Sam letter, if you had, uh, according to them, if you had followed these clues, you would find, the per find them. The 22 Disciples of Hell and John Wheaties, rapist and suffocator of young girls. Okay. That's a bit long. Can't put that on the tattoo. No, no, definitely not. Definitely Keep not. Short. Keep them short. <laughs> exactly. My so advice now, to serial killers: come up with something, right? Like keep uh, it punchy. Exactly right. Right, like the Ripper. It's always good to use Ripper, a, a name like. <laughs> you can't go wrong with that. He actually, yeah. that was the uh, model, right, for others to follow. <laughs> right. So this although is the... he didn't. Although he didn't choose that, though, did he? No, I think that was chosen. That was given to him again by the press, which um, well, the press initially named Berkowitz as the 44 caliber killer. So they they gave him that moniker first and then he Uncreative. named himself. Um, so John Wheaties. Right. All right. So 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 this is very, very uh, important for people to file away in the mental cabinet. John Wheaties is named as a as a member of this cult in the Son of Sam letter. So what does what does Maury Terry do the day after the arrest before he's even thought about writing a, an article about this before he the, the ultimate evil was even a glimmer in his eye? What did he do? He opened up the Yonkers phone book. And what did he find? He found this in the Yonkers phone book. Carr, John Wheat, 316 Warburton Avenue, Yonkers, which is the address of the Carr family that we are talking about now. Sam. Francis, Wheat, Mike, and John Carr all lived in that house, um, and so on and so forth. So, of course, Maury rightly freaks out, right? He sees John Wheaties in the Son of Sam letter, and then he looks in the Yonkers phone book, and he sees John Wheat, and that is the beginning of his obsession with thinking that there were um, multiple accomplices of the, uh, of the Son of Sam. So what Maury does is he then starts a conspiracy investigation. OK, so he's intrigued by the John Carr information. He finds out that John Carr's nickname was Wheaties. He speaks to people around town. Yeah, that was his nickname. Yeah, he was called Wheaties. He loved to eat Wheaties, man. We called him Wheaties. Yeah, everyone knew him as Wheaties. Right. So Maury's like, yeah. And this guy lived in North Dakota and 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 he looks exactly like one of the shooters. He was involved. So then Maury goes to the Brooklyn D.A. with this information. Now, why does he go to the Brooklyn DA? Because, well, they were they were um, partly in charge with the investigation. They the one of the crimes that happened in Brooklyn and he went out to Brooklyn to well, to see if the DA would be interested in his story about the conspiracy. And what does he find? Well, he finds that they're actually intrigued. And they actually had some inside information about John Carr themselves. They had started to quietly make inquiries into John Carr irrespective of Maury Terry. They had uh, had some information on their own. And so when Maury comes to the Brooklyn DA with John Carr information, and Brooklyn DA already has a little bit of John Carr information, the two of them meet, and it creates ripple effects, okay? 
And the ripple effects are such that a month after this meeting takes place, John Carr is found dead of an apparent suicide in Minot, North Dakota. Of course, with the implication being that he found out that they were looking for him to question him about Son of Sam. And because he was guilty in Son of Sam, instead of facing the music back in New York, he chose to put a shotgun in his mouth and blow his head off. So then all of a sudden, this, all of these confluences of events, right? The, the, the letter that has John Carr's name in it, the entry in the phone book that says John Wheat, Brooklyn DA making inquiries, John Carr killing himself. All of a sudden now, other DAs start getting interested. And, and Maury Terry finds a very sympathetic ear in the, um, in the Queens district attorney. Now, I think we should probably say something, Scott, real quick. For those who don't know New York City, New York City consists of five, what are called five boroughs, Brooklyn, Queens, New York, Bronx, and Staten Island. Each one of them has their own district attorney. Okay, so Queens is under the Brooklyn, the Queens DA, and Brooklyn is under the Brooklyn DA. And and four of the attacks had taken place in Queens. So Maury, he exhausted Brooklyn DA. They were no longer interested in helping with it, helping him after a certain time. He brings his story to the Queens DA, where four of the attacks takes place, and he presents a compelling enough ev uh, evidence to them that they they take this conspiracy angle very seriously, particularly the John Carr angle, very seriously. And what they do is they had heard some other information from a, a, a New York detective called Hank Chinati, named Hank Chinati, who dovetailed some stuff that he brought to the table and so that there was a North Dakota connection as well. And all of this confluence of events led, leads the Queens DA to reopen the Son of Sam case in 1979. So this is the uh, article that Maury Terry wrote about that, again, for the uh, Westchester newspapers. He was very, very proud of the fact that his work got the investigation reopened. Uh, this dead case now was opened again. So Queens DA... They Wait, go I'm out. Sorry, what, what year was the book published? What the book was, was published. In, the book was published actually in 1987, uh, years after all of this took place. But he was he was writing uh, these newspaper articles from the from 1979 to 1981. So, so for prior two, to the book coming out, how did he have the credibility to be able to have this sort of influence on on getting published? I mean, obviously, we know publications just want to sell newspapers, and so they're happy to have anything, but. Why pay attention to him? You know, that's a, actually a great question and one that I don't think any Son of Sam researcher has a actually ever sat and asked, asked themselves, which is one of the great things about having people like you, Scott, who are not invested in this case, but who have sharp minds. Um, you, you're coming to this and you're asking these questions that are actually fairly obvious. And, and I think any one of my fans in the audience out there will ask themselves, wait a second, that's true. Why did they take him seriously? Because he didn't have any. But, but I think I think what happened was and this is editorializing. OK, I just want to make that clear. I think the Queens D.A. was afraid because there was this guy, this brash guy up in Yonkers who was making hay with all these newspaper articles and I think that he pressured them into um, into investigating this. I don't think that this was something that they necessarily wanted to do. I think that there were machinations behind the scenes and he and they were almost their hands were almost forced. Um, but that's something that we can speculate on to the ha cows come home to roost. The truthful answer is I have no freaking clue what made Maury Terry so special that they would take him seriously. And it's a great question that we should ponder. Yeah, I mean, I would understand if the book came out. Because then you'd be like, okay, right. publisher uh, right. probably looked into this. The legal team looked into it, got it. But no, that's, that doesn't seem to be the case here. Right. I mean, maybe it was just simple fact of all of these articles were coming out, put a little bit of pressure, and they didn't want bad bad publicity. I mean, that's the only thing I can think of, and it's along the lines of what you're thinking. And of. he had, I'll just, I'll make this really quick. I know you want to stick yeah. to what you're doing. Of course. But who the hell was he? I mean, did was he ever a journalist before? Did he ever write anything before? What was his? He literally his... came out of nowhere. What did, how did he, how do you make a living before the book? he was he was working for IBM 
uh, as a staff writer for their in-house newspaper. And before that, he was working for a couple newspapers up in a town called Portchester, a small little Westchester town. But he yeah. was just writing, you know, BS copy editing or editing articles like nothing. He, you know, like he, he wasn't doing anything really special. So mm -hmm. your question is actually a great one. And I think a lot of people in, in the audience who are, are fans of my show and who've, who've been with me for the last year and a half, I think they're probably like smacking themselves in the head, just like I am saying, yeah, why was Maury so special? Um, so anyway, so but regardless of what the reasons were and why, Queens DA went out to North Dakota. They went to Westchester. They interviewed dozens and dozens of people, including Wheat Carr, Sam Carr, Francis Carr. Um, John Carr was unavailable to them. We'll get into the other brother in a second. They they interviewed so many people. They went out to North Dakota to inquire about John Carr. And what did they find out? Well, according to Maury Terry in, in, in The Ultimate Evil, the results of the Queen's D, DA investigation involved the following. Okay. John Carr and David Berkowitz knew each other unequivocally. All right. There was no question whatsoever, according to the Queen's, uh, according to Maury Terry's interpretation of the Queen's DA investigation, that John Carr and David Berkowitz were friends. John Carr was fearful of being questioned in relation to Son of Sam. This was a huge part of the investigation. <clears throat> he was talking about New York, <clears throat> people from New York coming out to kill him. He was afraid of his of the of the of this guy named Reeve Rockman, who was the head of the cult in New York, one of the heads of the cult in New York, uh, coming out there to kill him. He, he, John Carr was showing pictures of this guy, Reeve Rockman, to anybody who would listen. This guy wants to kill me, right? John Carr was a member of a satanic cult in both, in both North Dakota and Yonkers. Okay, This was a, a huge part of the findings of the Queen's DA, again, according to Maury Terry. And according to Maury Terry, John Carr drew the son, the son of Sam symbol, the same one that Berkowitz wrote in his in the in the son of Sam letter. John Carr was the one that gave him that idea because John Carr, months before the son of Sam letter was ever printed, drew the same exact symbol in a North Dakota phone book. OK, months before the son of Sam letter was printed in New York. And of course, that son of Sam symbol is right here. OK, the famous son of Sam symbol. Multiple witnesses, according to Maury Terry in The Ultimate Evil, multiple witnesses saw John Carr not only draw this, but explain what every little um, marker meant in this sigil of the Son of Sam symbol. In addition, the North Dakota investigation also found out that John Carr had proclivities to shoot people. He, he thought nothing of picking up guns and shooting people. It was learned that a Reeve Rockman Okay, a, a ringleader of the Son of Sam cult in New York City was seen in North Dakota with John Carr. Okay, huge piece of evidence because again, Maury linked Yonkers to uh, New York City to North Dakota, and eventually he's going to link it to California. Okay, but Reeve Rockman, this character of Reeve Rockman, is a huge part of the Ultimate Evil, um, proving that North Dakota and and New York City were connected. Multiple people in North Dakota also said that Berkowitz was in North Dakota with Carr, okay, that they were together, that they were hanging out, and that both were part of violent satanic covens in Westchester, specifically located at Untermeyer Park. So Untermeyer Park came up in North Dakota, which Maury Terry found was very intriguing as well. Now, here's where it gets interesting. There's another brother. His name is Michael Carr. Okay, we haven't brought him into the picture yet. But now we need to, because in 1979, Scott and the audience out there, as these investigations are going forth, as the, the go ahead, the, uh, the nomies, if you don't mind, the nomies, sorry. Yes. It'll, uh, it's going to take me a little while. I, I'll have to put that up on my screen as okay. the as Queens DA is, is high, high, heating up. As they're out in North Dakota, speaking to all of John Carr's friends, getting all of this intelligence on John Carr and his friendship with David Berkowitz and the fact that, Berkowitz, that John Carr wrote the Son of Sam symbol and that John Carr was a shooter. Well, all of a sudden, the other brother, Michael Carr, dies in a car accident in Manhattan. And what's interesting about that is that Maury Terry had literally just tied his name into the cult as another shooter. 
And even more interesting, it was the specter of Michael Carr, the other son of Sam, who was actually the person who introduced Berkowitz to the cult in the first place. So Berkowitz ties North Dakota to California. So how does Berkowitz tie this all this activity in North Dakota, this satanic activity in North Dakota, to California? Well, he does it via Arliss Perry. So remember Arliss Perry, Nomi's. Remember Arliss Perry in the beginning of our talk, the the, the young woman found um, dead in a satanic uh, a satanic murder in Stanford, California, in 1974. Well, look at what Berkowitz writes in a in a prison uh, book, a book that was spirited and and smuggled out of prison, and it made its way to Maury Terry, Arliss Perry, hunted, stalked, and slain, followed to California. So, of course, this is proof right there that Berkowitz knew what happened to Arliss Perry, that he was privy to all of the what happened to Arliss Perry. And the only way that he could have known this was, well, because Arliss Perry was from North Dakota. John Carr was a member of a violent satanic cult in North Dakota. There's the connection. OK, and the implication was Arliss Perry was going around telling people that this cult was existing in North Dakota. So the North Dakota cult had to kill Arliss Perry, okay? But but they had to do it in California, so no no one would trace it back to North Dakota. So when Arliss went to Stanford with her husband, Bruce, the North Dakota cult, including John Carr and his compatriots, they end up in California and they, they end up killing Arliss Perry. Okay, so that's, that's how Maury Terry connects <clears throat> North Dakota to California. But he goes even further with the specter of Manson, too. And this, of course, is how <clears throat> the original Charles Manson is brought into the whole mix. I hope everyone's following me here because I'm <laughs> I'm starting to get confused. Well, one of our fellow Nomi's wrote, uh, all you really need is some strings, some thumb pins, and Nick's cards, and a blank wall. <laughs> You start piecing anything together, right? Yeah, it's really it's really true. So so th all right, so we're starting to tie it together for you guys out there, okay? So Manson 2 comes into the picture. Now who's Manson 2? Well, Manson 2 is named in the Ultimate Evil as a uh, a, a, a an individual by the name of William Menser. So let's talk about this. Let's see what the book has to say about Manson 2, William Menser. Manson, too, wasn't from North Dakota, Vinny said. Now, Vinny was a made-up character in The Ultimate Evil who was an informant of Maury Terry. He was from the L.A. area. That's where the Son of Sam cult has its headquarters. The North Dakota branch wanted Arliss dead, and they called California for help. Manson, too, went north to Stanford to arrange it. At least one, maybe two people from Dakota came out to help. But it was Manson, too's show to run. He was involved with the original Manson and the cult there in L.A. That's why Berkowitz used that name as a clue. Berkowitz named Manson, too, as the shooter, uh, as, as the killer of Arliss Perry. And as we're going to see, a, a shooter in Son of Sam, connecting Arliss Perry and Son of Sam, connecting Manson to Son of Sam, connecting California to New York. This information. And, and, and once again, for people joining us for the first time, this is all. According to this book, according, to, according this book. to Manny Grossman. Okay, correct. So according to this book, everybody. So calm down, relax. This ain't Manny talking. <laughs> Manny's talking. His mouth is moving. But, but I'm, yeah, I'm using someone else's words here. Exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, so anyway, this information was so overwhelming. It was at first hard to believe, but Vinny wasn't done. This guy was an occult superstar. They used him for the most important jobs. Berkowitz met him in New York because he was imported from the coast to participate in the Son of Sam killings. He's the guy who shot Christine Freund in the Son of Sam case, and he was around for some of the others. He was back and forth, but he did Freund and was in New York for, I think, some of the later ones. So this is this is Bert, Maury Terry now speaking. Are you telling me a guy involved with Charlie Manson and the original cult in California arranged Arliss Perry's murder as a favor to North Dakota and then came to North Dakota for Son of Sam? That's exactly what I'm telling you, Vinny replied. Then why is Berkowitz trying to help solve the Perry case? Well, because he believes Manson, too, was the guy who had the most to do with picking him to take the fall on Son of Sam. He hates this guy and fears him. So he wants the Perry case broken for a personal reason? 
He may have a conscience these days, but he's got more in his mind than just trying to be a good citizen, Vinny said. And you got this directly from Berkowitz himself? Directly. Face to face. So this is the passage where Maury Terry then links North Dakota to California to Son of Sam. And he does it via this character of William Menser, Manson II. Okay. And again, you guys should read the book because he goes into more greater detail and he goes into, you know, Manson too was friends with the original mama Cass and the beach boys and Charlie Manson and that whole crowd out in Laurel Canyon. And he brings that whole thing into it. Okay. So, so this is where we're at. So let's recap. Son of Sam, according to Maury Terry, was not Berkowitz acting alone, as we learned last in last week's show. It was indeed a, a nationwide satanic cult that had tentacles in North Dakota and California, and that those tentacles from California came back to New York to perform Son of Sam, and that somehow or other John and Michael Carr and Wheat Carr were involved with this satanic group and, and, and were friends with, with David Berkowitz. So let's carry on. Well, this guy comes into play now. Now, who's this gentleman? Well, this guy is an is a impresario, a show business guy named Roy Radin. Okay. Now, Roy Radin comes into the ultimate evil as a very important character. Maury Terry names him as one of the main leaders of the Son of Sam cult in New York. And that certain Son of Sam crimes were done on his order, specifically the Moskowitz killing, the last Mosco the last shooting that Roy Radin contracted that murder to be filmed as a snuff film for his personal co collection. Okay? And that and that the Moskowitz shooting was done as a favor for Roy Radin. Now, why is Roy Radin brought into the mix? Well, because Manson, this guy, Manson too, William Menser, ends up in 1983 killing Roy Radin in California. Okay, so of course that's proof positive. Manson too had to kill, had to kill this guy Roy Radin. Because they were all involved in Son of Sam, and it was a cleanup operation that took place after Berkowitz's arrest. Kind of, kind of reminds me of that old Batman Robin TV show where all the villains are kind of friends and they hang out together, right? So you've got the Penguin, you've got the <laughs> yeah. Joker, right? And they're all just kind of like hanging out together, having their meetings, planning to take over the world. Mm -hmm. That's what, exactly what was going on. It, it, when, um, Maury Terry had this as every elitist in New York was involved with this. The mayor, the mayor's friends, Roy Cohn. Studio 54, the gay underground, Roy Radin, uh, uh, they were all involved in, in, in this Son of Sam spree. Hey, our buddy Eric here. Hey, Eric. How are hey, you, man. sir? Two great, great storytellers on one stream. Thanks, brother. Appreciate really it, Eric. appreciate it. And thanks to you and Rob for introducing us. Much appreciated. Yeah, that was huge, huge. Very, very and, Eric, cool. and Eric, of course, has been a very, very helpful to me as I've gone along in this in this video series. It's actually one of the reasons we became so popular was because of uh, the exposure on on Eric's show. Yeah. So in here, fact, if you, I'm sorry, in, in the description below, you'll actually see a link to our friend Eric's show that has um, has Manny in it. So in in, uh, in addition to Manny's channels in the description below. There's also one to Eric. So go ahead and subscribe to Eric if you can and like and like his videos and share them. He's a good friend of ours. Yes, for right, sure. Brother. All right. Thanks. So we don't need to read all this, but this is the passage from The Ultimate Evil that that um, where Maury Terry finally makes the uh, uh, the the conclusion that Roy Radin was the big guy. Right. So. So what about this Long Island money, man? Actually, we are going to read it. Berkowitz was at his place once. Yeah, this guy had a lot of parties for all sorts of idiots, dopers, bikers, big shots. I don't even know if he knew Berkowitz's name. There were a lot of people there at this jerk's place. So why was Berkowitz there? Because of the tie-ins with the cult and all. I don't know who he went there was, w went there with, but it was for one of those big parties. And what about the Moskowitz tape? That was made for this Rodan. Okay, so they're 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 getting this guy's name as Rodan, and then here all of a sudden, Maury Terry and his friend Mike Zuckerman both exclaim at the same time, "Roy Raiden! It's Roy Raiden!" Okay, and and so that's how they come up with um, IDing Roy Raiden as the head of as one of the ringleaders of the Son of Sam cult. But we have to go back to Westchester, guys, because so far we've heard Charlie Manson. North Dakota, Roy Radin is one of the heads of the cult. 
Well, there was another head of the cult, if you can believe it. Um, this cult had many heads, uh, and this this particular head was uh, we're going back to Westchester, back to Yonkers, back to White Plains. Uh, we've already been in California, North Dakota, and Long Island. Now we're going back to Westchester. So the leader, the overall leader of the Son of Sam cult was a guy who Maury, Maury Terry identified in the ultimate evil without a name. He just called him Mr. Real Estate. And this is from Carl DeNaro's book. Carl DeNaro is a victim of Son of Sam. Uh, he wrote a book called The Son of Sam and Me, Why I Was Not Shot by David Berkowitz. Uh, Carl DeNaro believes um, still to this day that he that that Maury Terry was correct and uh, and that he was shot by a woman. Um, but Mr. Real Estate, the leader of the cult, he was also identified as Moloch and the mastermind behind the Son of Sam attacks. All right. So let's talk about Moloch here. Moloch? So, Wait a minute. Yeah. So he's also <laughs> identified, you yes. know. The, uh, now that Eric's here, let me just mention really quick. The other day I mentioned to him, you know how every time there's a political scandal, it's something gate, this gate, yeah. that gate, yeah. something else gate. And yeah. there just needs to be a panel formed, you know, just a handful of us. And anytime a scandal comes up, contact me, contact Eric, you know, contact us and we'll say, look, we'll put together a scandal uh, name, a good name. And in an hour, you'll have something good. Well, in the future, if there's any kind of serial killer or anything and the newspaper people, they can't come up with anything, we should form a panel. You, I, Eric, we'll grab a few other people. And okay. we'll come up with something better than Mr. Real Estate. Yeah, I agree. We, and, and, and especially Moloch. I mean, damn, that's unoriginal. Yeah, but, no kidding. But anyway, Moloch, Mr. Real Estate, is supposed to be tied in with Roy Raiden. And that's how Roy Raiden ended up reaching out to this guy, Mr. Real Estate in Westchester. Mr. Real Estate being the leader of the Son of Sam cult, he then got his minion. We'll get to that in a second. So I, I'm going in a little ahead of myself. So Mr. Real Estate is the leader of the cult. And this is a picture drawn of Mr. Real Estate by a guy who Maury Terry called Billy the Artist. Billy the Artist, according to Maury Terry, was a, a teenager who hung out in Untermeyer Park in 1976 and just happened to be there the night that Moloch was there. And under the cover of darkness, using only firelight as his uh, as his light, he sketched this very, very detailed sketch of Moloch. And of course, Maury Terry goes into detail about how when this guy died, Billy the artist was at his funeral and positively identified him to the cops, so on and so forth. But the Westchester connections are as follows. All right. So Mr. Real Estate, the guy we just saw. He lived in the White Plains area and was the leader of the Untermeyer Satanists. Now, Untermeyer Park was in Yonkers. So this guy who lived in White Plains, a totally different town in Westchester, was the head of a cult in Yonkers. Okay. So the Untermeyer Satanists, when we saw pictures of Untermeyer Park, the Devil's Cave, in the beginning of this show, they included David Berkowitz, John Carr, and listen, almost two dozen other people. There were 22 people in this cult. They called themselves the 22 Disciples of Hell. So not only was it David Berkowitz, John Carr, Michael Carr, and Wheat Carr, there were also 18 other people involved with them, all, all part of the Son of Sam spree in one way or another. Now, David Berkowitz, Disco Dave, was at Mr. Real Estate's house. This is all according to the ultimate evil. Okay, This is how the Son of Sam attacks were planned out. David Berkowitz was at Mr. Real Estate's house with high-level elitists and members of a cult called the Process Church of Final Judgment, okay? And at this meeting, the Son of Sam murders were planned out. Now, Process Church of Final Judgment, again, this is how it becomes international because the Process Church of Final Judgment comes from England originally, ends up in California where they then are supposedly involved with Charlie Manson. They move to Westchester in New York after the Manson thing, and then they infiltrate the Untermeyer Satanists. And by 19, by, in 1971, they infiltrate the Untermeyer Satanists. And by 1976, they are hanging out with now Moloch at his house with David Berkowitz, and they're all planning the Son of Sam crimes. Again, this is the exact story told in the book. I'm not embellishing, making up, trying to make this. I'm just telling you the story as we as we son of Sam heads believed it for so many years. 
So this was the this was the the meeting in in 1976 where the Son of Sam attacks were planned, and David Berkowitz was attending. Uh, David Berkowitz from Co-op City in the Bronx was hanging out with 10 or 11 very high level bankers, lawyers, judges, elitists, and they were all talking about mass murder. Uh, and they trusted David Berkowitz to go out and 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 enact their plans, okay, along with John Carr and so on and so forth. And as proof of this, Maury Terry said at the time at the time of his arrest, a letter was found in Berkowitz's apartment, warning of a satanic cult that had been established for quite some time. Now the process had been around for quite some time at this point. It was said that they planned to kill 100 women. That's how Berkowitz spelled it as part of a ritual. So in other words, the theory, according to Maury Terry, was that high level people like Roy Radin and Mr. Real Estate in New York, who had connections all over the country to, to satanic hitmen and snuff film people, they somehow or other got together in, in 1976 and decided that they were going to wreak havoc on New York City. And then they ended up teaming up with a cult called The Process, which had infiltrated into the whole milieu as well. And that in 1976, there was a meeting of process people, David Berkowitz, and they were and they and they and they planned Son of Sam and that they sent this cult out, the 22 Disciples of Hell, which included John Carr, David, Mike, David Berkowitz, Mike Carr, Wheat Carr and 18 other people to go out and shoot, shoot a hun- at least 100 young women. And of course, here's the first result of that, right? You know what? Before you go any further, I'm going to very yeah. quickly pull up a map because I know a lot of people have no idea what we're talking about as far as when we talk about Westchester. So I'm going to bring it sure. up just very quick. Absolutely, and let's just please. Show people what we're talking about. So this is Manhattan right here, this island. So everybody sees that. You've got Brooklyn. So that's there. That's Queens, right? Where the majority, like you said, of the murders the took to- place. Yeah. Here's Yonkers all the way up here. It's a whole other world, isn't it? A whole other yeah, world. Totally. Yeah. And then this is Westchester. So you've got Mamaroneck, which, by the way, I actually very briefly lived in Mamaroneck. Oh, um, yeah. So nice very place. familiar with. Yeah, it is nice. And New Rochelle is right nearby. And you got Larchmont. Oh, yeah. New Rochelle, Larchmont. And, so it's right there on the water. Go ahead. Right. And White Plains is like up there near Scarsdale, Hartsdale. It's actually a little bit north of there. So White exactly. Plains, where Mr. Real Estate lived, was even more north of there. Scarsdale and Hartsdale, yeah, and you got and you keep going a little bit further this way. You're in, in Connecticut, right? And of course, there is a whole Connecticut connection to uh, in the Ultimate Evil as well. Roy Cohn, dead dead children on his property. I mean, it's it's kind of endless. Exactly. Um, but uh, but all right. So so right. David Berkowitz is at his house. High level elitists and members of the process. The son of Sam murders are planned out, and their 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 directive was to go out and kill a hundred young women. Well. David Berkowitz enacted that plan on on July 29th, 1976, chatting in a car, girl met by death. And this and we showed in last week's show, this was the beginning of Son of Sam. This was the killing of Donna Loria. Okay, this was the first Son of Sam attack, which resulted in the death of Donna Loria and the wounding of her friend Jody Valenti. So Son of Sam starts here on the orders of of Mr. Real Estate. Who's who's friends with Roy Raiden, who knows Man- Manson too from California, and and Man- and and as this shooting spree goes on, other shooters are brought in from other places of the country. North Dakota shooters are brought in, contracted killers. Manson too from California is brought in, and at the end of this, Berkowitz is only responsible for two of the. Um, eight attacks okay so he only says that he shot the girls in the bronx that he did this one and that was it only the bronx and that he, everyone else did the other shootings and this is maury terry in 1993 in his very very famous some would say infamous interviews with with david berkowitz where um, Berkowitz lays out for Maury Terry in great detail all of the exact uh, specifics of, uh, of each crime, about how he didn't do it, and about how it was a cult that did it. And um, so this is Berkowitz relaying that, and uh, there were eight attacks. Did you do all of them? And then the thing that Berkowitz says is, no, I was at all of them, but I only pulled the trigger in two. He was a lookout, a scout, a getaway driver, and the other ones, he was a soldier in a satanic army. 
So here's the thesis boiled down to its most simplest, uh, most simplest form. David Berkowitz was a patsy for a nationwide satanic cult. This cult, called the Process Church of Final Judgment, set up shop in early Westchester in 1971, infiltrating the Untermeyer Satanists by 1977. Remember, the Untermeyer Satanists existed already. They had been around since the 50s. But in 1971, members of the process went up to Untermeyer Park and infiltrated that group and took it over. David Berkowitz met affiliated members of these groups in 1975 and by 1977 was a soldier carrying out orders from above. Berkowitz then, after the, after the arrest, took the fall for the cult and pleaded guilty to avoid exposure of other guilty parties as well as to protect his family from retaliation from the cult. And I have to say that, uh, Scott, that's the presentation. I mean, it, 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 we could on each one of these things, we could go down rabbit holes that would take us five hours, each one of them, but we're not going to. I wanted just to lay out, lay out the essential thesis in its main bullet points. Um, and then I suggest and I highly recommend, actually, that people do go and read The Ultimate Evil. You watch Sons of Sam documentary um, because it's just instructive and you, you might end up believing it and in which case hey have fun um <laughs> got, we got a question if um yeah. they also thought he was the tape measure or <laughs> rapist but no one talks about this why don't they talk about it i never heard of that ever ishgade um i'll have to look that up so right now i have no comment on that the tape measure rapist that's the problem <laughs> with being that nobody that's why nobody talks about it because nobody could say it how do you say the tape measure or, or, or rape? Imagine that. Yeah, you're in the, it's very you're in hard the to say. Yeah, you're in the newsroom, right? You're on, you know, 1010 wins, right? You're on WOR. And you're like, <laughs> yes, hello. Uh, new update about the tape measure or, 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 or rapist. That's a problem. So, yes, this is another example, by the way, of how you have to be very careful with your choice of a name if you're a villain. Yes. Right? I mean, think about it. The Joker. The Joker. Easy. I was just thinking. Yeah, it's so the, easy. The Penguin. Uh even right. I think Batman didn't they have King Tut and that guy had like that cream of wheat thing a piece of cereal <laughs> King Tut. From his chin. yeah 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 on his chin right that little thing that was hilarious yeah think, wasn't that the same actor that played the um the Riddler or something I don't even know I think I think they were recycling actors at that point but, I hope um, not the Riddler was actually gonna... the Riddler was a famous actor I forgot his name I'm just convinced that everybody watched that it wasn't even kids who watched Batman in the 60s it was probably no, just I haven't watched I've, I don't know Jack and I've seen it. Yeah, I think it was just adult uh, smoking who weed. Was the... Oh, Frank Gorshin. He played the original Riddler. No, there was somebody else who played him. No, wait, that wasn't Frank Gorshin. I don't know who the hell it was. But yes, it was. Uh, he had some cream of wheat or something hanging from his mouth or <laughs> from his chin. It's creepy. King uh, well, why don't we look at, let me ask you some, we'll go through some of these questions here. We'll see what people have to say. But prior to you, Manny, and some yes. of the others in, within your orbit, did anybody ever push back on this guy and this this book of his, or did he have just free reign to go ahead and throw this out there and no one said anything? Um, there's a whole, I can do a whole series of shows just on that, but the essential, the essential nut meat, as I like to say, that's my favorite word, yeah. is um, no, nobody pushed back. In fact, a whole cult of personality formed around Maury Terry and he ended up starting a Facebook page in about 2000, I don't know, 2004 or five. And it just became this whole um, group of acolytes fawning fanboys and fangirls. And he would deign to every now and then throw them a little bone of information. But most of the time, Scott, it was actually quite pathological. He would he would he would speaking of Riddler, he was he would write incredibly long riddles for people to figure out in order to get one little piece of information that only he had in his head. So it became this very weird um, sort of like uh, 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 abusive relationship that he had with his fan base. And it was actually quite unseemly. And so not only did anybody did not did any did nobody push back on him. He was treated as if he was God by by the, by his fans. Um, but I mean, just listening to some of the things you said, I mean, just the names of some of these people. I mean, I'm not looking to make a joke out of this, but honestly, when you were reading off the Mr. Real Estate and the rest of it, I'm sitting here thinking, 
of like this stupid <laughs> freaking 60s show, you know, with these $10 props and this guy like, all right, we, we need well, something we, to put on his chin. Well, it's hilarious that you say that because we subsequently found out that Billy the Artist never even existed and that the picture of Mr. Real Estate that we saw earlier was actually a drawing of Mr. Creepy from from Creepy Magazine. If you want to get if you want to find maybe a picture of that. Um, Mr. But, Creepy? I mean, yeah, Mr. Creepy from Creepy Magazine. If you look at that, maybe I'll get back up my uh, you can find that if you can find that I'll, I'll get the picture back of Mr. Real Estate. But, you know, it's hilarious that you say that, because as I was putting this show together, I was talking to a confidant of mine uh, and he's in the in the chat today. Book Club Warrior 22 who's an, who's a, a great friend of the show. Wonderful human being, just a, 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 a trustworthy guy who I can throw ideas off of. I said to him and he'll attest to this. I was like, you know, I just put this show together and my biggest takeaway was how the hell did we believe this horse shit in the first place? It's astonishing. Uh, did you want to believe it? I mean, what was here's the here's the to use Joe Biden's famous phrase. Here's the deal. We I was a conspiracy head, Scott, and I still am in many ways. You want to talk to me about conspiracies of the day? I'm down there with you. Um, but I came at, at Son of Sam from the very, very bad theoretical framework of being a conspiracy theorist rather than a detective or a cop. And everybody was looking at this crime in the same way. We were so influenced by satanic panic and Maury Terry's uh, cult thesis. It was just so compelling. It just spoke to something that we needed in our lives. I'm not quite sure what. We can do, we can do a lot of analysis just of that, why people are so into um and 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 hang so many hats off of yeah there he is off of um off of conspiracy theories and and if anything this this case has taught me that cons and I say it all the time to my fans conspiracy theory and true crime need to be delinked we well, need to think right the words conspiracy theory whoever came up with it and brilliant the CIA came yeah, up yeah. With it. We, yeah brilliant because those two words combined Shut you down in Shut 10 seconds. Shut you down. Yep. You will not say this. You will not say that in fear of looking like some lunatic. Exactly. But if it got, but if it got embraced, because just another theory, right? It's like, okay, but right. how many times has it been proven, right? What do we see the difference between a conspiracy theory and a and the fact is what? Nine months? Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it keeps, it's very and it keeps, little. Uh, yeah, and then it becomes six months and three months and one month. So, you know, it's hard to believe anything anymore. So um, you found creepy here, I see. I couldn't find a photo. This is the best I've got. Is that him this, reading? In the... That's him reading it right there. And if if you want to get back up, I have on the uh, I have on my. Can you share my stuff, or do I need to share it? Um, isn't this? You must. I can. So, okay, do, so share. Okay, so share. Hold on. Um, isn't this it? You just at the last page, and you're. No, no, no. I took it off, but I, okay. you have to stop your stop the screen and and re and reshare. But it doesn't matter. It's it's it it, it, it it's Mr. Creepy. Um, that was actually right. something that we exposed on my video series that that uh, that Maury Terry was having people draw caricatures from from these fan ma these magazines, and he was presenting that as fact to people. It was it was. I mean, I didn't want to get into this on this show. I really wanted to just dispassionately and uneditorially tell the cult thesis. But, you know, I guess no, it's impossible. This was, this was very important. I think what the show last week, which was to lay the foundation, because let's be honest, there's people that are watching the show and will watch the show that don't know anything at all. Right, right. And so sometimes, and I've told you I've made this mistake quite a bit, sometimes I assume that people already know some of the things that I know and I'll start talking. And they're like, what the hell is he talking about? You know, Correct. so sometimes you just have to kind of back up and say, okay, here's the foundation. Mm -hmm. Here's where it all began. This is when it took place and the rest of it. But what was, the, so the author outside of this book, mm -hmm. what else did he do to keep the wheels in motion? Did he have another book that came out? Did he go on the, uh, did he write articles? What was his involvement no. after the book? Was it just he hit and run? It was hit and run. He had very little involvement. There were a couple of updates. He he went on, of course, in the 80s, the Geraldo circuit, you know, inside information, uh, 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 um, unsolved mysteries, you know, kind of like the pop culture shows of the day. Geraldo show, Sally, Jesse, Raphael, Morton Downey Jr. By the way, I love Morton Downey Jr. Um, <clears throat> but um, 
that was it. It's it's I don't even know how he made a living, to be quite honest with you. Uh, never seemed to have a job. Um, and he ended up become this case ended up becoming him and his life and just subsuming him and his life. And that was it. He ended up actually dying in his parents' attic, uh, completely, you know, choking on his own, um, I don't know, bodily fluids because he just, he just could never. And, and he never, then he never ever gave anybody any real information. It was always here, solve this riddle and maybe I'll give you a clue. Right. And we're going to learn, I think, when so, we have our next show. show oh, sorry, Scott. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I think we're going to learn on our next show because um, because I, I, we've we've laid out the crimes and we've laid out the cult thesis on our next show. It's going to be a greatest hits of every way that I've debunked this theory uh, for going back for the last year and a half. And we're going to actually use eyewitness testimony, documentary evidence, police files, um, and uh, and that's the way to do it nowadays. And actually, what we've done on our video series is revolutionize the way people approach true crime. And it's having a lot of influence out there. People are realizing now that just going to a newspaper article isn't good enough anymore. Reading a book isn't good enough anymore. You need to get off your ass and knock on doors and, and just like the police would. And I now only use, for the most part, I, I try to only use professional law enforcement, both active and retired, to help me out because they're the only ones that I most mainly trust now because I need I need forensic analysis. I need detectives' minds. I don't need this conspiracy stuff anymore. Talking about Moloch and talking about Mr. Real Estate and Roy Raiden. It turns out that Menser did kill Raiden, Roy Raiden, but it had to do nothing at all whatsoever to, with Son of Sam. It had to do over a, over a movie deal with Robert Evans, the Cotton Club, and yeah. that's a whole other story. So all of these things came out. The, the killer of Arliss Perry was found. It was had nothing to do with North Dakota. It was the it was the janitor at, at the uh, at the at the church. So all of these things came out, Scott, in the ensuing years. But it never changed people's minds. The Maury Terry fans. None of these things existed. My video series doesn't exist to the Maury Terry fans. I can show them proof right up to them. And, it, and still, it will not matter to these people. So we've 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 already figured out that there's just no getting through to that set, and we're moving on. We don't really care anymore. We're 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 just trying now to show what what to the best of our ability what we think actually happened, and it's completely opposite from Maury Terry's thesis. Yeah. Well, you have to understand. In, in many ways, it's sort of like the um, Johnny Depp Amber Heard situation. You have people because you know I attended the trial and I met people on online. And I've interacted with people on Twitter. And I hate to say this, and I don't want to offend anybody, but you are dealing with a lot. There are a lot of people in the world with very severe mental illness. Oh. And and they're, they'll jump on something. They have obsessive compulsive disorder. So they're constantly on Twitter. They don't want to feel like they're missing out on anything. And it's tweet, retweet, tweet, retweet. And they just they get caught into this wor uh, whirlpool, right? Just right. kind of sucked in. And right. there's just no way they're getting out of it. And you can tell them, look, you're in quicksand. You're in quicksand right now. Get the hell out of the quicksand. They don't want to get out of the quicksand because they're in there with other people right, that are in the quicksand too. And it's like, no, no, no. We're supporting each other. We're this and that. And so you probably have a lot of people that go from, if it wasn't the son of Sam, it would be something else. Right. And listen, I hear that there's, I mean, I don't get involved in it, but I hear that there's very similar infighting in the Manson world and in the uh, Craig, whatever that killer um, in Colorado, I forget his name and in his and in his true crime world that there are all these factions. So my attitude is at one point in my life, I was concerned with it and I was so into trying to convince people. And now I don't even care anymore. I know I, I know what happened. My audience is there with me and we've moved on. I mean, we're not even, we're not even concerning ourselves anymore with, with this stuff because we can't, if you, if, and listen, I think people will say, I did a fair job today uh, uh, t talking about his thesis. How could anyone believe this after, after hearing this? I mean, it's unbelievable. It's difficult to, yeah. I mean, people were um, commenting, um, our fellow Nomis, Nomis and they're right. saying like, you know, you listen to this, it's like, why would anybody even believe any of it? So as far as law, enforcement is concerned is this mm -hmm. case closed is there it anything was, is there any unanswered questions as far no, as law enforcement it was it was closed the night of the arrest when berkowitz very succinctly and with and but with great detail confessed to each crime and new details of each crime so but, he, yeah, but you said in, there was an interview was that correct in an interview he said he was there 
Well, this is what does that mean? That's the interview with Maury Terry in 1993. Remember, Berkowitz was arrested in 77, confessed to the crimes. Uh, the police wrapped it up. Case closed. He pleaded guilty, went to jail and the public moved on. The killing stopped. There was no other incidents. There wasn't a continuation of this 100 women killing all over the city. It all ended. Everything ended when Berkowitz was arrested. But the interview that I was talking about, Scott, was uh, the interview that Maury Terry, the author of The Ultimate Evil, conducted yeah. with uh, Berkowitz in 1993 while he was in jail. And the reason why I said it was infamous and I didn't want to get into it uh, earlier in the show was that if any fair minded person watches this interview, Maury Terry literally gives Berkowitz all the answers that he wants to hear. And then Berkowitz regurgitates them back. There's nothing original and there's nothing coming from Berkowitz's head that wasn't planted by by Maury Terry. Yeah. Um, let's just for the fun of it, assume that everything in the book was true. Just for the fun of it. Let's just say that. Why would it be true? Why would these people even want somebody to go running around New York City shooting at couples and cars? What would be the motivation for that? Is this a human sacrifice? Is it to cause chaos? Is it to chaos. get back at the police? <clears throat> chaos. Pure terror and chaos. It was, uh, according to Maury Terry, the process, this was a satanic ritual that was, that was um, conducted on the entire city. And the whole point was to raise fear, raise the fear to ultimate levels and, and create terror and havoc. Um, so... Did uh, Disco Dave, as we affectionately uh, call him, <laughs> and belittlingly call him, what uh, what was his motivation if he's being in, when was the last time he did an interview and what was his motivation as far as you know? Well, it's highly interesting that you say that. We, um, My partner uh, and co-host and co-producer Eric Galati and I just did a show on this uh, earlier today. Um the, the truth is he gives motivations to whoever he's speaking to. He gives the motivations that he that 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 person wants to hear. So to some people, it's demons. To some people, it's the barking dogs. To some people, it's the pressure in his life because he couldn't get girls. Um, the noise in the neighborhood. Uh, but what I personally think was that this guy was just lonely, friendless, mentally ill, schizophrenic, went off the deep end and a, a whole confluence of events. He ended up living in a place where dogs were barking and bothering him. And it just drove this insane man crazy. And I think we're going to show in our next uh, installment of this, I'm going to show very starkly, not only how Maury Terry lied to us, um, bullied, manipulated and abused us, but also how in Berkowitz's own words and writings, he gets into heavy detail about the about each crime. He wouldn't have known this unless he actually did it. <clears throat> and he talks very starkly, and we're going to show in his own writings about his motivations and what led him to do all of this. Yeah. So is he presently you know, in uh, a normal, I mean, you know, uh, state lockup, or is he in a mental facility? No, no. He was he he pleaded guilty. He was not found insane. He ended up in Attica originally. He's been transferred to all sorts of prisons. I believe he's in either Dan Mora or Shawan Gunk prison right now in New York state, but he is in um, a, just a New York state prison, uh, not a federal, you know, not a county jail. And, and as far as I know, he's in general population. I, I don't know that for a fact, but he also has taken on this whole persona of the son of hope where he now is a, a born again, Christian and, um, and so that's his entire identity now. And so he actually has seemingly quite a bit of freedom in prison and uh, is always um, ministering to people, hanging out in the church. Uh, seems, sounds actually like he's having a grand old time, uh, quite honestly. Is he married? No, he never had a girl, never had a girlfriend. And the only time we ever heard of him having sexual relations was on uh, a friend of his, John Comparetto, related the story on one of my interviews, which people can watch. It's one of the first videos on my, on my site. Have you ever made any attempt to contact him and to interview him and meet him? And if not, why not? I have not. And I have given a lot of thought to this. And the reason why I haven't is because we have learned um, through our research that Berkowitz is a master manipulator and a liar. And whoever he's speaking to, he gives them the story that they want to hear. He did it to his psychiatrist. He did it to Maury Terry. And I have no doubt that he would do that to me. So, so because of that, I don't trust one word Berkowitz says 
So I don't even consider him an important source anymore. I, I, I go straight to the police reports, straight to his writings from 1979, where he writes in stark detail about what he did, how he did it, why he did it. Um, and that's what I use for my for my sourcing on this. Uh, in addition to speaking to people, first person testimony from Yonkers, people who knew the families, you know, the families that he victimized. I got in very, very heavily with with the Neto family. I've done a whole series of videos on that. Uh, um, I like to speak to the primary sources as much as I can. Yeah, um, what, you know, I was thinking about him getting that ticket. And I was wondering I was if, yeah, I was wondering whether it, even, let's just assume that it wasn't a conscious effort, uh, even though he wanted to be caught. I'm thinking that in the back of his mind, it may have also been a subconscious effort because he wanted to deprive the police, the, even the, the real ability to track him down and get him. You, it's oh, like, hey, I made it easy for you. You, that's amazing. You would have caught me if I didn't, you know, lead you right if here. If I didn't, right, if I didn't allow I didn't need you this to trail do of it. popcorn right to my door. Correct. I think that that's another great insight that only a person disconnected from this case like you are coming to it essentially for the first time through us. That's an insight that I think is brilliant. And I was actually giving a lot of thought to this, too. And I was like, why the hell did he do the shooting after he got the ticket? He knew he got the ticket. Yeah. And it's funny because on one hand, you could assume that he's arrogant. But on the other hand, you could also wonder if it was low self-esteem because it's almost like uh, stories with relationships. Sometimes somebody has such a fear of their boyfriend or girlfriend cheating on them or breaking up with them that they'll go ahead and do the breaking up just so they could get it out of their mind and not have right. to worry about right. being left and being abandoned. It's like, no, I'm going to be the one to do this. And you'll do some self-harm to yourself just for your own self-possession, you know, your own mental self-preservation. Well, he didn't leave me. I left him. That's right. Thing. And so I wonder if that, it, like I said, could be subconscious where he's like, well, they didn't catch me. I actually come on. I let it right. Let them write to me. That's a great thing. And, and it goes with something that he did write in his letters to a psychiatrist. He, he wrote very starkly. He goes when he when he, he said these murders were planned for years and it was always his intention to get caught. He didn't want to not get caught. He wanted to get he wanted to be discovered. So you might be onto something here. This could be the only I mean, it's 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 actually a very logical thought, given the fact that he got the ticket and then went and did the shooting anyway. Yeah, I, I personally think by this point in Berkowitz's life, it had, a year had gone by. He was going nuts. He was probably very frantic. He was he was worried. Um, maybe even felt a little subconscious guilt. I don't know. I doubt it. I don't think so. But I think he just wanted it to end. And I think that um, one of the things he said to the police officers now, it's debated whether he actually said this or not, but it's reported that he said to them when they arrested him, what took you so long? And I don't think he was talking about the year long spree. I think what he meant was, hey, I, you guys got that ticket 11 days ago. Why did it take you 11 days to find me? I've been going crazy yeah. for this 11 days. Waiting yeah, he, for did, you guys. he didn't mess up. He did not mess up. That was not an accident. Right. Because like you just said, he knew he parked there at a high and then he and then he still went out. And, did and, a according, and according to basically everybody's um, testimony, a, a witness who saw him, uh, who saw him, a woman named Cecilia Davis, she said straight up that he saw that he got the ticket. He picked up the ticket. And in fact, she said that he got in his car and followed the cops. Yeah. I don't know whether how true that is. And now I'm starting to think, wait, did he even know he got the ticket? Because we only have that from that one witness. But he did park at a hydrant. So even if he didn't know that he got the ticket, he had to assume that he was going to get one. Yeah, but not interviewing him. Your your reasons for it, it makes sense to me. I um, when I was a kid and I heard the defense of temporary insanity, and this is like me as a kid, and I'm like, there's no such thing. Either you're insane or you're not insane. But as time goes by, and I meet and interact with people who do have various levels of mental mental illness, mm -hmm. I'm amazed to see that there are people who Okay, so you've got bipolar, that's one thing. And then you have people that on top of that, you have incredible paranoia. So then there's that. Then you have people that have OCD and you have all these things compounded and you could look at them perfectly normal, everything's fine. And then something happens and then you've got all these different layers of things going on. Mm -hmm. And so I can imagine it would be a complete waste to have a conversation with him because you have no idea what the hell's going on in this guy's mind, what he thinks, what he imagines happened. 
I have zero. I have zero interest. In fact, I have a reason to feel that way. He recently gave uh, um, Carl Denaro, right? Carl Denaro, one of the victims of Son of Sam, who to this day is still Maury Terry's. Uh, I I personally think he's one of Maury Terry's biggest fans. He he doesn't seem to want to come around to uh, to this new information. He wrote a book, Why I Wasn't Shot by David Berkowitz. He actually visited David Berkowitz. He was sitting in there for three hours with the guy who shot him, begging him to tell him who shot me, who shot me. And then Berkowitz gives him a packet of process documents. He's like, here, uh, uh, here, it was the process. And I think Berkowitz was just having such a good time trolling this guy. Such a he was he was in internally enjoying it like like he was reliving those days again. Yeah. I, I was watching that uh, this I don't even know what it's called behavior panel right those four guys that watch body language yeah and they watched an interview with um oh god the guy who ate people the hell is his name the, uh, the Dahmer Dahmer yeah and they're just and you just you watch his body language it's a whole different planet than what's going on in his eyes right yeah and you could also imagine he looks like the nicest dude it's like yeah jeffrey come on over let's yeah. have some nog you know well, Berkowitz... around the christmas tree and the guy meanwhile in a second he'll you know bite your neck and start right. chewing on you start chewing on you and berkowitz took advantage of that very fact he was very aware of the fact that he looked innocent he wrote about it in his uh in his psychiatry letters he writes i love my face because people don't think that i'm the monster that i am i'm yeah. paraphrasing that but that was essentially what he wrote and it's it's very very i mean this is this is this story to me is so interesting not because of the crimes at at this point i've just i've just brought this down to its simplest form it's one psychotic man who went out and did seven uh, eight shooting incidents and killed six people and wounded and wounded seven um now it's pretty rather mundane we have we have spree shooters all every day we have we have people killing people randomly every day um but i think it was actually a rather mundane set of crimes that uh i think that i've explained and and made sense of to my own mind but what i always find fascinating is yeah this whole need for people like you said before to just have to have everything connected in with it it's just some compelling need and to me that's a fool's game that's a fool's errand because you'll always be spending your time chasing that rabbit down the hole yeah and we also can't uh take away the fact that he also might have been just kind of a dick yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah just you know pissed just, off at the world or what this guy gets to make out with a chick i don't i mean just could have been just a total jerk total off. just a dick yeah and so well, his friends his friends wanted nothing to do with them i mean we we spoke to his friends everybody who was at all the nomies out there we have interviews from his childhood and teenage friends. Once he, he he was, according to them, he was a nice guy, went to the army, came back completely different, and they wanted nothing to do with this guy anymore. Yeah. Um, they would try to avoid him if they saw him on the street. It was like, really, it was kind of that bad. And I think that that was one of, that was the, the life that Berkowitz came back to from the army. And I think it just set him on, on this, on this, well, the, this destructive path, which unfortunately other people had to pay for, yeah, you know, with their lives. Uh, Linda's a Linda's a great uh, great friend of ours, great fellow Nomi, and she says, um, "Thank you for coming together and sharing with us. Uh, this has been amazing, Manny. What is your hope in exposing all of this false information and truth?" Well, the main hope that I have with this, Linda DB, and thank you so much for this comment and all your other great comments. I've been notice, noticing them uh, for the past week. Uh, my hope is mainly to um, Maury Terry victimized people. He not only victimized, re-victimized the, the actual people who lost their lives and who were shot, but he victimized the Carr family. Wheat Carr for, in, has had to live since 1979 a totally innocent woman the woman who actually fingered berkowitz to the to the cops she's had to live now for 45 years with people accusing her of first degree murder so my mission now with this linda is to bring some sort of justice to to people falsely accused as well as try to calm down the true crime community in general 
and get conspiracy theory out of true crime where it doesn't belong. Now, if you're talking about stuff like JFK with huge international implications where there's major things that ride on this one man's life or death, well, then come and talk to me about conspiracies. You want to talk about 9-11 where there's huge international implications for whoever benefits from that. Come to me and we'll talk about 9-11. But you want to talk about this guy named David Berkowitz living on Pine Street, wigging out his apartment, waging war against his neighbors, terrorizing the nettos, terrorizing the cars, shooting people. Don't come at me with this with this international cult stuff because it just doesn't make sense. It's illogical. And you wouldn't have 22 people all keeping silent all these years. It's just not possible. Uh, our, our fellow Nomis like to point out periodically, they mentioned the satanic panic. Do you have any idea what that is that you could explain to some people who don't know? Yes, the satanic panic was a was a trend in the 80s. It kind of started and listen, I love heavy metal, right? I love old Iron Maiden, love Black Sabbath, Dio, Ozzy. I listen to it all day long. Um, but in the 80s, it, 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 it was like this big thing with the moral majority and, and 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 at those times, conservative parents in the United States, they were concerned that their children were being influenced by the devil that the devil was speaking to them through music and through art. And so, and that they were all- Of course, Al Al Gore's wife, by the way, was the head of that, I believe. Correct, right, right. And uh, and so a a term was coined, satanic panic, to kind of poo-poo these people. Um, But what's interesting is there actually was a lot of this activity kind of going on in the 70s and 80s. Um, but, but a lot of it was done by teenagers who were just kind of just like having a good time. Right. Like we're like, we saw those pictures of the devil's cave at the beginning of our presentation. And I, and I said, satanic cult written by the graffiti, written by this, by the Satanists of Untermeyer. That's what Maury Terry said. The truth was that graffiti was all written after Berkowitz's arrest in the eight, in the 1980s by teenagers trying to troll people into thinking that there was a son of Sam cult that had nothing to do whatsoever with David Berkowitz. So, um, yeah, the satanic panic was just this trend where everybody was worried that there was a Satanist around every corner to, to, to destroy the youth of America. And Maury yeah. Terry exploited that. He took advantage of that, of that, um, latent, not even latent, that, that, that thread of, 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 uh, 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 culture in the united states and he exploited it to write his book i have heard from the publisher from people who were in the know in the publishing world that maury terry originally put in a manuscript that was several hundred pages less it included nothing from california nothing from north dakota and that the publisher said this is boring sex it up man and that the next manuscript he had all of a sudden manson was involved (laughs) manson too was involved and and all this stuff yeah, there's an interesting uh, conversation going on in the chat about the, you know, the sketches and how they could look like different people. And so, you know, you could also think, oh, look at all the different people. But these sketches are never supposed to be accurate. They're not like that. Because, oh. for example, this would be uh, uh, Disco Dave right there, right? That's Disco Dave. But just couldn't it just as easily be, and uh, may, this might possibly be a stra- stretch, but couldn't it also be the Big Ragu? It's not the big red group from the bridge, surely. I mean, there he is, right? It looks like him, yeah. And any listen, any policeman worth his salt will tell you straight up that if you base your 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 whole life on, on this case or any case around a sketch you're playing a fool's game that sketches what if they don't arrested the big ragu. Imagine the problems that would have caused. Because this was around that same time, too, wasn't it? It was. In 70s. fact, that guy looks that guy looks like he was Berkowitz's brother. So for all we know, could, he could have been. This could just easily be called the Laverne and Shirley murders. <laughs> yeah. Right? Imagine exactly. if he left like a Coke and pe- a Pepsi and a milk and Pepsi at every scene. Exactly. And l- let me tell you, we're going to see pictures next week of David Berkowitz with a, with a hairstyle that's exactly like the hairstyle John Carr had. So, you know, all of these sketches, people people are hanging their hat right now. The Maury Terry, the Maury Terry camp which is dwindling in number every day, um, they are hanging their hat still on the sketches, right? Well, the sketches were all different. Well, uh, yeah, any policeman will tell you that means nothing. Sketches yeah. are not a, not a good way to uh, solve crimes. No, because we could do this all day long. All righty. Well, listen, we've hit uh, our deadline here. We try to get this done within an hour and a half. I believe that's our goal at all times. Perfect. But I would like to point out, though, in reference to Linda's question, if I had some sort of underlying um, you know, incentive uh, to try to participate in this and try to do things. 
it would be nice. I don't even know what to say. What could have caused this kind of misery? And, you know, in a person's life, I mean, obviously we have mental illness, but what other factors could possibly drive people to engage in this kind of behavior? Because you never hear about stuff like this happening. Well, maybe you do. In like, you know, in Savannah, Georgia, right? right. You hear like a small town where people know each other and they could help each other. And there's some sort of um, friendship and family and, and, and roots. And so you have a lot of stuff where you've got these loners, yeah, right? The anomie, the anomie of the big city. Yeah. And so I guess our world is just too big at this point. And you just have too many people that will just never even know their neighbors or, or anything about what's going on. And so you just Absolutely. have a lot of, you have a lot of sad people that are just driven, you know, to the brink, which is a shame. And exactly. I think that's, what's good about communities like ours, that even if we cover uh, conversations like this, you know, in subjects, topics that aren't the most pleasant, we try to at least lighten it up a little bit. We have some fun and, right. it's you know, necessary. and we've got kind of a place to hang out and we're able to figure stuff out together as well. Right. And so, you know, maybe this will also prevent things like this in the future because, you, you know, you wonder, oh, well, this person is, you know, torturing dogs or whatever it is. That's not normal. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, I mean, if they're breaking apart gingerbread men cookies, that's that's OK. Well, Who does he it? Well, listen, he was. But I told you last week, David Berkowitz, in addition to all his other youthful crimes, he was the crusher of matzah. Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. And so I actually think that we're going to have to d dive into that a little bit in our next show, his motivations. And I'll put I'll put together a lot for that because I've already done it. Uh, I've already done that work. And um, he's very stark in his motivations. And we'll, we'll get into that when we, you know, on, on we'll leave that for for there for the audience. Yeah, because what's bad notes. about crushing matzah is that it, it, that it's done. It's over with. Yeah, you, you can't, can't cover that. No. Yeah. You can't be like, all right, well, listen, you know, he's had a bad day, but, you know, scoop it up. It's like Humpty Dumpty. You can't put it back together again. You cannot That's do that. It. The only thing you could do is make matzo ball soup or cholent. That's it. <laughs> I think you're right, my friend. All right, everybody. Listen, uh, we appreciate you being here. Manny, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Uh, you also have uh, a gardening show as well because you yes. put together some cool shows. So just tell everybody about that. I think they'd love to know. Well, before I became um, uh, got involved in the true crime world, specifically the Son of Sam world, which is really my my only interest in true crime, honestly, uh, I was and still am a landscaper and gardener. I was an instructor at the famous New York Botanical Garden School for ten years. I've been running my my fine gardening estate boutique gardening business here in New York since two thousand nine, where I take care of very large co op uh, properties and. Um, and, and I'm also into farming and permaculture. And really all I want to do is live on a farm and grow food and, and watch the lizards, uh, you know, open their mouth at night and let bugs come into them. I, I find that to be one of the most fascinating things ever. Very, very cool. All right. So you've got your show where you discuss gardening. You've got your show where you're dispelling all these myths. Mm -hmm. And so what else do people have to look forward to when they check out your channel? Is that these are your main focuses right now? That's it. I mean, I may branch out now that I'm starting to hang out with the with the big boys, you and Eric and all these lawn lumber guys. Maybe I'll start branching out, but I tend to stick with what I'm good at, which is um, really uh, my I feel like I've I almost feel like I've been. This is a calling for me that uh, that the son of Sam that that I feel like I don't know, it sounds weird, but I feel like I was the person to to that had to that that needed to come out and do this. I know it sounds very egotistical, but I, I really feel that that's the no, case. it's great. Somebody has to be the leader of the pack and you're doing it, which is awesome. So it's much appreciated. I know everybody appreciates it. So, and you and I are in discussions about doing a show about, about Fryer gardens and stuff like that. Yeah, we Fryer should Park. definitely, so we'll definitely do that. All right, everybody. So this concludes this episode with Manny and we're going to be doing another one. So please subscribe to my channel and like this video and share it and comment. That would be awesome. Same thing with Manny. You can check out the links in the description below, as well as to our friend Eric Hunley. Go ahead and click on that. Um, before we go, please do me a favor. Do yourself a favor. Uh, go to a kill shelter. If you could adopt a cat or a dog, uh, they're in cages right now. They're very unhappy. They're sad. It's a miserable life. And if you have it in your heart and in your home to go ahead and adopt a cat or a dog, um, it'd be one of the greatest things you could ever do. The amount of joy that you will get by saving a life is really beyond price. So if you can go ahead and do that, if you know somebody who could do that, that would be awesome. Go to a kill shelter first. A regular shelter is fine, but if you can go to a kill shelter, you'll really be saving a life. Uh, so please do that, cat or dog. That would be awesome. And let me know. 
send me a tweet or send me a message, whatever it is. Let me know and send a picture of your new furry friend. Uh, it would be awesome. If you have any thoughts, like I said, about the subject matter, please put them in the comments below and share what's on your mind. And uh, also, I've written a whole bunch of books. So if you desperately want to buy something called a book, it's it's kind of cool paper and uh, text printed on it, uh, photos. You know, you remember books, right, Manny? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I read them every day. Still. Awesome. So if anybody desperately wants to buy this thing called a book, they still exist. Go on Amazon, type up Scott Cardinal, and you'll see these books that came up. Don't ask me which ones. I no idea. Uh, buy the cheapest one. That's what I would do. <laughs> and uh, check out my website, audibleadventures.com. Check out my sponsor, which is Treat Yourself Shop, uh, which is all sorts of all natural nutraceuticals. Until next time, Manny and I wish you. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you to all the mods. We have the best mods on the planet. So thank you very much to the mods and to all my fellow Nomies and for new visitors who have joined us. It's much appreciated. Until next time, we wish you safe travels and all your journeys. See you next thank time. Thank you.